What is going on, adventurers? Today, we are going to talk about something a little bit different. Today, I want to focus on a topic that affects all of us, and it's where does your meat come from? Now, if you're super interested in nutrition, um, want to learn more about health, uh, fitness, anything related to that, or just want to learn more about the food industry, there are tons of other podcasts that are probably a better fit than this one. This podcast is primarily for hunters, anglers, hikers, campers, mountain climbers, just outdoor adventurers in general. And whatever your sport, whatever your passion, um, as long as you eat meat, I think it is important to look at how it is sourced. So that is kind of the topic and framework for this episode. So right off the bat, no, I am not trying to scare anyone into being vegetarian or vegan or anything like that. In fact, it's much closer to the opposite of that. The more I learn, the more I'm actually scared of heavily processed foods, of sugars, and extremely grain-based diets. A whole lot of vegan and vegetarian options go out of their way to avoid meat, yet still want to pack in protein and pack in some of the minerals that are lost when you avoid meat. Um, sometimes they even go so far as to try to pack in things that taste like meat. And to do this, they are heavily processed and they are absolutely chock full of additives. So in avoiding meat, you are likely ingesting insane amounts of GMO soy, of food dyes like uh, yellow 5, red dye 40, stuff like that, preservatives, lots of sugar, synthetic flavorings, and binders to hold it all together to provide texture and just general structure. I recently talked to a coworker of mine who tried the Impossible Burger from Burger King. And I had my opinions about the issue and she had hers, but I found it interesting that they don't actually market this Impossible Burger as being any healthier or being better tasting. They primarily just focus on the fact that it tastes just like a Burger King burger, but with no beef. The name Impossible Burger seems to be about the most genuine thing here. Paying real money for a fully synthetic patty is definitely something that should be avoided. In fact, let's look at the actual ingredients list. So this is from impossiblefoods.com, the company that makes the ground, quote, meat that goes in the Burger King Impossible Burger. This is actually from their FAQ section. So what are the ingredients? An impossible burger is made from proteins, flavors, fats, and binders, almost like every burger you've eaten in your life. The key difference, our ingredients are derived from plants. So blah, blah, blah. They talk about why it's good that it's, in, that it's derived from plants. Um, but let's just skip on to the ingredients list. So in this impossible burger, it actually contains water, soy protein concentrate, coconut oil, sunflower oil, natural flavors. So far, that sounds pretty good. Uh, and then potato protein, methyl cellulose, yeast extract, cultured dextrose, food starch, modified, soy leg hemoglobin, salt, soy protein isolate, mixed tocopherols, zinc gluconate, thiamine hydrochloride, sodium asorbate, niacin, peroxide hydrochloride, riboflavin, and vitamin B12. So that is a long, complicated list that I even struggle to pronounce. A lot of you probably actually know how to pronounce these things for real and probably notice I'm butchering them. But my point is they go a long way and add a lot of other stuff to avoid the beef. Now, I would expect this sort of thing from a military issue MRE, but not really from a commercial restaurant. I work in marketing, and it's really interesting to compare 2020's Burger King Impossible Burger and Impossible Meats with the old iconic Where's the Beef ad from Wendy's when they actually bragged about giving you more beef in each burger. So in understanding where our meat comes from, let's quickly just talk about production meats, what you just get in your grocery store. 
There are a lot of people who are really concerned with these. I think sometimes for good reason, sometimes unnecessarily, but ultimately it's just good to know more about them. So generally, production meats are pretty safe. With improved farming, ranching, feeding, processing, and packaging methods, commercial meat production gets better and safer every year, at least in terms of reducing foodborne illness like E. coli or any other bacteria or anything like that that generally occurs when things are handled, processed, or just otherwise packaged poorly. In general, shipping methods and distribution is also getting faster and more efficient, not just in the meat industry, but in any industry. And so, of course, that that necessarily falls into the meat industry as trucks are required to track where things are generally at all times and grocery stores want things faster. Ultimately, that means things go from the slaughterhouse to your local grocery store to be packaged up and sold and then to your freezer or to your table faster, meaning your meat is generally fresher than it has been historically. So all in all, that's a pretty good thing. But rarely do we actually think about where our meat comes from and how it gets to our freezer. We tend to spend a lot of time counting calories or thinking about vitamins or carbs or stuff like that, but not as much just on the actual kind of tracking and history process of our food. So I think the beef industry is a great place to look at first in this discussion because honestly the beef industry gets a whole lot of scrutiny and it's a huge, huge industry. And there's a lot of, I guess, unpleasantries associated with the beef industry. Because there is a huge demand for beef, it's a large animal that takes up a large space it necessitates that there be significant infrastructure. It takes a lot of land to raise a solid herd of cows. And then it takes a pretty large processing facility to kind of finish off the beef in terms of getting them generally fattened up and ready for market and then processing them, packing them, all that. There's a lot of industry, a lot of infrastructure, and a lot of places to screw up and go wrong. So there's a lot of places that do a great job um, where there's really no complaints, where things are done very safely, um, as humanely as possible. But just because it's such a huge industry and you have premium meats to just low-level scrappy competitors, you're going to get a lot of diversity in the way things are processed and handled. Generally, there are a lot of regulations from the USDA as to how things are required to be handled, but like any set of regulations, there's some gray area. There are some things where you can say, don't do X, and you can do something similar to X as long as you're not doing X and it's okay. So regulations get really interesting because you can always, it's like setting up a gate in the middle of the woods. Sure, you can choose to walk through that gate and do everything right. But if you choose to walk around it, it's usually pretty easy. So the regulations, I think, do generally help quite a bit, um, but they're changing. And a couple of years ago, actually, Congress even voted to remove the country of origin label on beef and pork. And that was pretty controversial. So here I'm actually going to kind of step out of my own realm of knowledge and I'm going to cite somebody else's work. So this is an article from Forbes magazine by Nancy Fink Hunergarth. I believe I'm saying her last name correctly, but maybe not. Uh, an article... It's actually an old one from 2015 called Quashing Consumers' Right to Know Congress Repeals Country of Origin Labeling for Beef and for Pork. That next steak or pork chop you buy at the grocery store could be from Mexico and beyond, but you'll never know it. On Friday, Congress repealed the Country of Origin Labeling Rule on beef and pork after the World Trade Organization imposed $1 billion in retaliatory import tariffs against the United States if the rule was not overturned. The repeal was part of the omnibus spending bill signed by President Obama. COOL, or the country of origin label, mandates labels on packaging that reveal the country or countries where the meat animal was born, raised, and slaughtered, while beef and pork will no longer have to comply with the COOL rules, chicken and lamb must still be labeled. 
Canada and Mexico had argued that mandatory U.S. labeling programs discriminated against meat imports and violated the World Trade Organization limits on what sorts of product-related technical regulations WTO signatory countries are permitted to enact. Meat packers also complained that the cost of complying with the COOL program was too burdensome. The United States has lost two rulings and appeals with the World Trade Organization regarding the country of origin labels since 2011. The import tariffs were authorized by the World Trade Organization on December 7th. So that was from Forbes magazine. Now I'm kind of stepping back into my own thoughts here. So in general, it sounds like some of the fines and complaints from the World Trade Organization were the start of this whole issue. So that's not really the focus of this podcast. Um, the focus is, again, knowing where your meat comes from. So the fact that the country of origin label is no longer required in the United States, regardless of why or how that was enacted, I think is something that consumers should know and should be aware of. So I'm not really aware of any issues with Canadian beef, but admittedly, I've not really looked into the issue much. I don't actually have a reason to investigate it. I'm sure there's somebody who knows a whole lot about it and could tell you the good, the bad. I'm sure there's there's pros and cons like everything. It's not all good. It's not all bad. Um, but Mexico does concern me for a couple reasons. Foodborne illness and safety practices in Mexico are not as stringent as in the United States. We have a lot of regulation. So in order to own a beef packing facility or to sell your cattle off your ranch to a meat processor, there's a lot of documentation that has to be done. There's a lot of inspections, and generally there's a lot of standards for procedures that are accepted to make sure that meat is safe as it goes to market. So I'm not going to weigh in too much on the difference between Mexican beef regulations and American beef regulations, but if you just look at just off the top, rates of foodborne illness in Mexico are significantly higher than the United States. And so whether that's the actual facilities, whether that's how meat is processed and cared for, or whether that's disease from other sources that maybe are somehow getting mixed up in this meat, uh, I can't quantify that. But I think just looking at the top, there is some reason for concern. I also see the concern of Mexican beef not being totally about Mexican beef. So I'm going to quickly parallel to the steel industry and parts that are used in the automotive industry and industrial stuff like washers, dryers, refrigerators, stuff like that. So there's a lot of companies, and I'll just use Ford as an example. There are a lot of Fords that are built in Mexico with Mexican steel because that Mexican steel is not necessarily Mexican steel. You can go down as an American company to Mexico and get cheap labor, and Mexico can import Chinese steel or steel from other places very cheaply because they do not have the tariffs that the United States has with China. So steel comes in from China or other places, gets fabricated into auto parts, gets loosely assembled. Sometimes cars are completely assembled. Like I know some of the cheaper Fords are completely assembled in Mexico now and then brought to market in the United States. Or sometimes they're done as kind of 80% complete, brought to the U.S. That's where they're wired up, tuned up, and kind of finished. So what does that have to do with meat? Well, if stuff is coming in from Mexico, that just means that's kind of the last place it was before the United States. Because Mexico is much looser on import regulations, we really don't know where this meat's coming from. Now, I think the basic economics of the thing sometimes dictate that you're not going to grow a cow all the way across the world, ship it around just to get it in through Mexico into the United States. But I think for some things that could be the case, especially in the case of where there's high demand items or just you're trying to fill a surplus, things could come in through Mexico where you really have no idea how that meat was raised, where it came from, and when it's packaged up and sold in your local grocery store, you just generally know it's beef and how much it weighs, but you don't know where it actually came from. And again, that is a point of concern. So as I mentioned earlier, meat packing regulations and the general accepted processes of bringing meat to market in the United States 
are very safe for things like foodborne illness. The rates at which you have E. coli outbreaks and stuff like that, yeah, you hear about it in the news because it's those sticky stories that get a lot of coverage, but it's not especially common, not at all. But because the demand to bring more product to market faster, it pushes manufacturers to be more efficient in some things that you kind of can't force, like the natural growth of an animal. It starts getting dangerous the way you kind of force these things, like using bovine growth hormones to help cows grow faster, and most commonly, grain-finished cows. So you, you'll see a lot of labels in a grocery store for grass-fed beef, grass-fed free-range beef, stuff like that. Well, most beef starts that way. Uh, I hunt on a, land, a lot of ranches in Texas, and you'll look around, and you'll see cows eating grass on every single one of them. So generally, this isn't something that is actually at the ranch level. It's something that happens once you bring that cow to market. So the rancher will raise these cows for several years and then bring them to market. But then a lot of times these cows are basically stuck in small pens where they are fed lots and lots of grain to fatten them up. So this improves the fat content of cows in a very cheap way. So they can increase the overall mass of the beef that they're selling and have generally fattier, tastier beef in the marketplace. So I'm absolutely not blaming ranchers for any of this, and I'm not necessarily blaming um, kind of the meat packing facilities and these butcheries and, and places that kind of finish out the beef. What I am, I guess, wanting to bring light to is that these things are being done, and we're not critically aware of it in our decision-making process. So the beef that you're just buying in your grocery store is not a very natural product. Even if it started that way, it ends up being a cow that was really fattened up, fed a whole lot of GMO corn, and not that I'm particularly against GMOs. That's, a, again, another topic for another day. But it's been artificially pumped up to make it a marketable product for you to buy in the grocery store. And generally what you're eating is not natural, and most people don't know where it came from or how it got that way. So there are several documentaries that discuss this in overwhelming detail, and I'm not really going to endorse any of them in particular. They're very easy to find. There's a lot of really big ones, and there's a lot of smaller kind of grassroots documentaries as well. But I'm not going to endorse them because they all seem to have some underlying political agenda. In order to produce a documentary like this, somebody's got to pay for it. So somebody has a bias into why they're producing it. But many of the facts that they cite in these documentaries are solid. They are true, but then they spin them in interesting ways. So do your research on your own, but proceed with a bit of caution, approach it with a little bit of skepticism, and just be open to looking at both sides of an issue, just as you would making any other informed decision. So one thing I do want to straighten up when I'm talking about kind of the way meat's processed and how it's handled and all of that, I am definitely not discussing this to encourage the enactment of more regulations. The dominantly libertarian part of me still struggles with that. Every regulation still has a workaround. In my analogy about the gate set up with no fence around it, well, if you're told that you have to walk through the gate, if you're a good, honest man, you probably will do it, even though it's kind of a pain to open that gate and shut it behind yourself. But if you're looking to just be as fast as possible and get away with what you can, you're just going to walk around the side of it. And I think that's how every regulation ends up being. A lot of people go through the gate because they're told to, and they say, well, okay, that's just the way it is. I'm going to do it. But there are a lot of people who are going to choose to go around it. Every regulation works that way. And ultimately, every regulation bloats the size and scope of government control, whether it actually helps anything or not. Think about all the rules that would need to be written up. You would have to pay somebody to write these, publish them, distribute them, uh, people to inspect and enforce all these rules. Government regulations are occasionally effective, but rarely are ever efficient. And usually, in order to enact a regulation, whether it works or not, it's done at great cost. 
I am advocating for, however, is consumer awareness. In general, people are not critically aware of where their meat comes from, and we should be. This is why I'm a bit torn on the country of origin label issue. So the libertarian side of me says, yeah, the government shouldn't force people to have to put all these labels on their beef and label all their packaging and just cover it up with all this stuff. It shouldn't be required. But the other side of me says, well, it sure would be nice to know where this stuff comes from. I think that's very important information to have. But ultimately... When I walk into my local grocery store, I live in North Texas, so Tom Thumb is a pretty common grocery store chain here. Um, there's a bunch of other ones. Uh, there's a Whole Foods pretty close to me. There's a Sprouts pretty close to me. There's an Albertsons pretty close to me. When I look at the meat section, when I go into Tom Thumb and Whole Foods, I see companies that actively do this on their own. Whether they're required to or not, they'll brag up that, yeah, this is Texas beef. Like, this is beef from Texas. You're buying local. And some of that is just Texan pride and ego. And I get that. And in some ways, I embody that. Um, but ultimately, it's just knowing that, hey, this is meat from here that I'm buying. It's fresh. It's good quality. And I know where it comes from. But then when I walk into uh, Albertsons or even Trader Joe's. I like Trader Joe's for a lot of things, but I don't buy meat from there. Um, they do not have those labels on a lot of things. And God forbid I walk into Walmart, who knows where that meat's coming from. So the free market does solve this in general for people who care, for people who are looking for it. And I think that's one of those things where if you look at the opposite side, where it would be required by a government regulation, so you're required to put it on there. Well, if you don't care to read it, if you don't care where your meat comes from, it doesn't much matter whether it's required to be on there or not. Um, but for the people who actively do care, like I'm urging you to be, uh, choose beef that proactively markets this and informs their consumers where it's coming from. So stepping away from the beef industry example and discussion for a little bit, I think fish and kind of the fish industry and marketplace is a much better example. As far as I'm aware, I think the country of origin label is still required on packaged fish products. So generally, I think that's a good thing in this case, but it's ultimately not because it's a legal requirement. It's good just because it's good to know where things are from. So also speaking generally, I recommend buying fresh, not frozen fish for a couple reasons. So the majority of the time, I think fresh fish just tastes way better. You'll pay just a little bit more and it more than makes up for it in flavor. If you are going to the store to buy fish and you're willing to spend a dollar, two dollars, just a tiny bit more, it's going to be way worth it in flavor. Now, this isn't always true because there actually is something called fresh frozen fish, which aside from being one hell of a tongue twister, is an interesting technique where fish are caught, gutted, and very quickly frozen on the boat. So they're frozen at the point at which they are their freshest, and then it is it kept frozen from there all the way to your grocery store. So that type of frozen fish sometimes is better than fresh fish that's never been frozen but is several days old. So flavor generally I think is better from this fresh fish for the stuff that you're buying in a grocery store, but not always. So I do want to consider that. So aside from just the flavor component of this decision-making process, I also want to look at the logistics. So with fresh fish, there is a much stricter, tighter timetable. And this plays directly into what you can do with that product. So from the moment you pull a fish on board the boat, whether that's in a recreational capacity like I do or in a commercial capacity, you're starting the clock. That's where you have limited time before that fish can actually be brought to market. You got to clean it, gut it, process it, distribute it, do all that while the fish remains cold and fresh and does not spoil and you got to sell it in the marketplace. So based on that, you can only go so far with that meat product. And so that means generally, when you look at how far you can ship fresh meat in short periods of time, 
efficiently. Because I think with things like FedEx and Air Freight, yeah, you can get anywhere in the world in, in a day if you need to. Um, but in terms of doing it at actually a somewhat efficient, high capacity method, you're pretty restricted to a small radius of where that fish must come from. And so naturally, I think that forces fresh fish to be closer to you and with a faster turn time. And that's generally a very good thing. Whereas frozen fish, if you're buying fresh catfish in North Texas, you know what? It probably came from Texas or Louisiana or Arkansas, maybe as far as Missouri. But it came from somewhere pretty close to you to make it affordable to get it to you fresh. Now, if you're buying frozen catfish, that could have come from Pennsylvania, Tennessee. It could have come from the other side of the world. It could have come from China. It could have come from any random country in Southeast Asia. And that's a place where definitely some of the meat processing standards and farming standards are not as good. And it does not take long Google searching some of these things on these Asian catfish farms and tilapia farms where you'll see things like a chicken coop suspended above a tilapia pond where the chickens are literally shitting into the pond and the tilapia are eating that. That's not the kind of fish you want to pay for. Definitely not. You don't want to be eating that in general, much less spending your good money for that when you could be spending just a tiny bit more and getting something that came from probably your local state or pretty nearby and is healthier, is fresher, and tastes better. So buying fresh fish has a huge advantage in knowing where your food comes from because it has to come from a much closer radius than frozen, pre-packed, vacuum-sealed stuff that could come from literally anywhere in the world. So another thing to discuss that's kind of interesting from a fish sourcing perspective is farm raised versus wild caught. Now there are some species that are almost entirely one or the other, like tilapia. That's one that more often than not, they are from a fish farm of some sort. So even if it's fresh tilapia, it just means it's a fish farm probably in your local state. And there's this rumor going around that tilapia is an like that it's a made up species, that it's some like genetic hybrid that's a non existent thing made only for the meat market. That's not true. Like tilapia is a real fish and it is hybridized regularly, but so are cows and sheep and just about everything else. Hell, corn is probably the most hybridized thing that could possibly exist. And so, yeah, there are tilapia hybrids, but tilapia is a real fish. It's not just like a market name for something. But that being said, the number one reason you see tilapia on sale a lot and you see it in every grocery store is because it's a really forgiving fish. It's a very easy fish to farm. It's like when you were in school and you were going to grow a plant for that one science class experiment. Guess what? You grew a, a lima bean in a cup of dirt because it was incredibly easy to get that thing to sprout. That's kind of what tilapia are. Really easy to grow in a variety of places as long as you feed them generally right and have them in warm water of enough circulation and depth, generally you can farm tilapia. Whereas other species, specifically saltwater species like uh, dolphin, which is mahi-mahi, or swordfish, you're not going to raise in a farm capacity ever. They're going to be wild caught. So sometimes the type of meat determines this a little bit, but there are some meats that can go either way. Catfish is a good example. You can go out to pretty much any river or creek in the United States and catch your own catfish, but most of the catfish that you're buying in a grocery store is not caught on a rod and line. It's from a catfish farm somewhere. Salmon is another really good example where in the marketplace you'll see a lot of each. You'll see salmon that actively brags about being wild caught, and then you'll see salmon that just doesn't really mention it. So that means it's usually farmed salmon. Wild caught is definitely better. It means it was naturally occurring fish. It means it was not in a pond that was full of minerals and chemicals to keep these things alive. It was not fed with commercial byproducts. It was a real fish swimming down a real river that someone caught, sliced up, and brought to market. So anytime you have the choice of fresh versus frozen, I recommend choosing fresh. Anytime you have the choice of wild caught versus pond or farm raised, I recommend going with wild caught. 
And so that's where this discussion is much more than just knowing where something comes from. Because if something's farm raised, it actually makes it probably easier to know where it comes from than something that's wild caught from a river. Because a lot of those things are bought and sold by co-ops and distributors. So you just have fish from a certain area that are wild caught versus from a specific pond. So it's not just about specificity. It's about knowing what you want and being able to choose it and being able to avoid that farm raised fish because it's got some of these chemicals and some of these artificial things and probably the flavor isn't as good so that you can choose out this wild caught stuff that's going to be a real fish in a real river that's going to taste better and you're supporting fishermen not industrialist farmers. Ultimately, anytime you're buying meat or fish or any protein from a store, try to think about where it comes from and what that may mean in terms of the quality of the meat and the economics around it. And while this may kind of come off as a bit preachy sounding, I will absolutely admit that I'm a hypocrite. I strive not to be, but just yesterday I finished a really long hike with my buddy Mike we got back to town, and we were just, after this long hike, it was over 20 miles. We were just craving just lots of food and kind of greasy, fatty protein. So we went into town, went to Chili's, got margaritas. Uh, he ordered a big old burger, and then I ordered uh, chicken and ranch bacon quesadillas. So looking at that, it tasted pretty good after the hike, but... I have no idea where that chicken came from, where that bacon came from, or where Mike's beef on his burger came from. So, yeah, I am a bit of a hypocrite. And the degree to which you can source this is directly related to the degree to which you cook and prepare your own food. If you are buying meat from a grocery store to cook a dinner at home, you can be a lot more responsible in sourcing where things come from. Versus if you're just getting production stuff, whether that's a fast food restaurant or going to the grocery store and buying something that comes in a box that has meat in it, and I would absolutely view those on the same level. Sometimes maybe even I would rate the fast food stuff higher as the processed stuff that comes in a box. But either one of those, you have less human input in that decision-making process. So yeah, I'm a hypocrite in some ways, and I don't do this as nearly as much as I would like to. But that's why this podcast is about kind of learn with me. Let's do this together and let's continue to look at where our meat comes from so that we can continue to make better decisions about that process. So ultimately, the best solution that I've found and that people have found for hundreds and thousands of years is to source your own as much as possible. So some of the ways that I do this are deer hunting. So every year I plan on killing multiple deer. And yeah, I do like the sporting aspect of it. I like the challenge. That's why I like bow hunting because I really like the challenge. But a big part of it is the meat. I really like the idea of an animal that's native to my area that is a very lean, high protein animal. And I know that when I harvest that meat, that it is the cleanest protein I can possibly get. There was no middleman in terms of somebody pumping it full of hormones or other chemicals. I dropped that animal, I cut it up myself, I packed it in my cooler, and I put it on my grill and cooked it. So I really like knowing that whole process and being personally involved in it. Even taking the deer, killing it, butchering it, all that, some of that for people who are not hunters is uncomfortable and is painful, but it gives you a grounding in reality because you're eating meat an animal's going to die, whether you do it or not. So being a part of that process and understanding that and saying, yeah, I'm okay with taking a life to feed my belly, being able to do that and understand it and do it responsibly and ethically and in a way that is replenishable and sustainable that makes sense, I really think being personally involved in it gives you a very solid understanding of that, much more than people who avoid meat or complain about the meat industry, or who are completely ignorant to the process and keep buying meat. I think it's very important to be involved in that process. And that's really a discussion of hunting in general, not just deer hunting. Now, deer hunting is probably the one I do most for just general sustenance. And I don't buy beef in a grocery store because I source all my red meat generally from white-tailed deer. 
Another one, and this is where I have the blessing and curse of living in the state of Texas, there are wild hogs everywhere. There are farmers who want to get rid of them, and hogs are absolutely wrecking things. Now, there are also people who are doing it almost as an entertainment vacation thing, coming down and paying a lot of money to kill wild hogs. Um, whether you're doing it kind of for eradication or you're doing it for sport, either way, you've got these critters running around freely that lots of people want to be rid of that you can kill and provide good quality, healthy meat. And I've had some people say, yeah, wild hog, eh, it's not good. And I've also cooked up wild hog that has been amazing, much better than some of the grocery store farm raised pork that I've ever had. So it does a little bit vary based on the size of the pig, the sex of the pig, where you shot it, how you took care of the meat. But ultimately, it's a target-rich environment where you can get this meat on your own, and a lot of it is very high-quality meat that you can know where it comes from. It's not going to be injected full of hormones or be overly processed. And if you do it right, it can almost be free. Now, that depends on your your gun budget, your gas budget, all that stuff. It, it varies quite a bit, but you're not spending money on that stuff and still going to the grocery store for pork. And it's a great option for just things like ground breakfast sausage, stuff like that where it gets seasoned and mixed up with other stuff. Yeah, that is processing your meat. It is eating processed food. I acknowledge that. But in general, if you can do that from wild pork it's a better starting point than going to the grocery store for the same thing so i generally always count on having some wild pork in my freezer at any given time fishing is another great option so just about wherever you live in the united states there's something you can fish and something you can eat now practice sustainable fishing i would say the tiniest fish you can catch that yeah you possibly kill and eat Unless you need food for that evening, yeah, probably throw it back. So I was kind of in this case recently. Kyle and I were on a camping trip, and for dinner that night, we kind of our plan was, well, we'll just catch something out of the creek, catch it and eat it. And that night, all we caught was a fairly small largemouth bass. And I know a lot of people who are like, yeah, largemouth bass, don't eat that. But actually, it's just a very generic tasting fish. It's not good. It's not particularly flavorful. But it's not bad either. It's just very kind of generic tasting. Uh, now, I would say a lot more people fish for largemouth for sport, just for the thrill of catching them and trying to catch big ones, than for actual sustenance. So people have different ideas on, yeah, kill all the small ones so that the big ones are in there for sport. Or the idea of, no, 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 no. don't kill the young ones. Let them grow up to be big, and those are the ones you should eat. So... Because I'm not really that much of a sport fisherman, I don't really have a strong stance or opinion on that. So I just generally go by kind of what's the legal limit? What have biologists advised the state on what we should be taking in this area? So this bass that we ate on that trip was just barely over the legal limit. So we said, well, we've got some stuff in the truck, but we can have something fresh for dinner. So let's cut them up, put some butter and some lemon in there, and let's have bass for dinner. So just about wherever you live, there's some fish you can catch. If you're up north and you have the benefit of being able to catch walleye, that's awesome. If you're down south and you can fish for bass or bluegill or one of my favorites, crappie, then awesome. You can go out, have fun, have a great trip to the lake, and when you're successful, end up with a great healthy meal at the end of it. And you know exactly where it came from. And even if you don't want to go out and hunt for your food or go out and try to catch fish, if you need something that's a little bit more predictable and regular, then look at getting some chickens for your yard or maybe even consider raising rabbits. Now, be careful with all those things because I think there's right ways and wrong ways to do it, and there's probably a whole wealth of knowledge on that topic. But in general, if you can do that, you can have food that you know what they've been eating, where they've been living, how they've been raised, and you can responsibly and sustainably source that food. And ultimately, when you're having eggs for breakfast or you're having some French recipe for rabbit that you cooked up or you're having chicken for dinner, you know where that animal came from. And it's a little bit more meaningful that way, I think. And you have the confidence of knowing that it's good, healthy meat and that you were involved in that process 
and it's just personally gratifying and meaningful. Now, if you are just absolutely drastically opposed to killing your own food, whether through hunting, fishing, farming, anything like that, first I have to urge you to take the blinders off. Either be a vegan, which is not something I really advocate, but either do that for the sake of logical consistency, or better yet, learn more about what you're eating, where it comes from, and how it can be done right, how it can be done responsibly, ethically, and if you're willing for an animal to die so that you can feed yourself, learn the best way to do it and learn to be okay with it. So if you do not want to do this yourself, what do you do? Well, find somebody who does. Find somebody you know or a friend of a friend who hunts. Now, the general hunter numbers in the U.S., some people say they're declining. I think in some areas they're actually increasing. But either way, I think you know somebody who hunts or you have a friend of a friend who hunts. You have some connection to it somewhere. Get to know this person. Most hunters I know are very willing to share. As long as you listen to their story about where this animal came from and why it was such a cool hunt, such a cool trip, and you know, why they shoot a 30 out six or whatever else they want to, they want to tell you about. Most hunters I know are great guys who are willing to share their meat. And so find those people, but don't just be a mooch. Like, please (laughs) consider something that you have to offer kind of in exchange. It's technically actually illegal to sell meat and a little bit offensive to hunters to offer to buy it off of them. I think maybe some people it's different for me. It would be So I'd say offer something in in trade. So a really good option would be something like a garden. So if you're interested in healthy, sustainable foods, but you don't want to harvest your own meat, then consider a garden. So if you're interested in sustainable, healthy foods, then you can have carrots, celery, vegetables of any sort that you know where it came from, you know what went in it, you know that it's free of pesticides, free of other chemicals, and it's generally safe and generally healthy. That's awesome. And now if you can find that hunter, that guy who's willing to share, you can have something to offer in return. That way you're not a mooch. You're just giving somebody something else. So you're actually helping each other out. You're providing vegetables. He's providing meat. Things that you can both do that fill your passions and that give you a little bit of specialization, which is kind of the core to all trade and all economics. But you end up both eating healthy food that's affordable, that's sustainable, that you know where it came from, and that's meaningful. So I know I've rambled on for quite a bit here. I've talked about some things that are general problems with the meat industry, things that maybe aren't problems with the meat industry, but problems with how we consume meat or how we shop for things or how we generally just ignore where things come from. And I've also discussed how I like to acquire my own meat. So I do not buy beef from the grocery store. I go out and hunt deer and I eat venison to source my own red meat. Now there are some things like if you really want chicken, yeah, you can't really go out and hunt chicken in North Texas. So I'll admit that, yeah, every once in a while I'll buy chicken to cook it up for something. But in general, I try to source as much as I can from hunting and fishing and from what's around me. So I've kind of talked about some of that stuff too. And then talked about some things like gardening and and just other ways to know where your food comes from. So in conclusion, be more active in knowing where your meat comes from and participate in that process as much as possible. Learn what you can about your protein and what you are putting into your body to sustain you and to strengthen you. Because what you eat and what you buy is ultimately an endorsement of what you support, and who you are. So do so carefully. All right now, I'm off to pull a deer steak out of the freezer to thaw out for supper tonight. Until next time, stay safe, be free, and never stop seeking adventure.